I'm a founder of the Copper Country Ancient Sites Conservancy, our small group here interested in the ancient copper use. Um, and our guest speaker is David Pompini, and he will speak. I'm going to give a little brief overview of the old copper culture. Let's, let's do that. Uh, first, I think it's important that we acknowledge that all the lands where we live and recreate are the homelands of Native Americans who've been in, they've occupied all of North and South America for tens of thousands of years before settlers started showing up 500 years ago or so. And here around the Great Lakes are the Anishinaabe. And they're made up by three groups, the Ojibwe that are here, all around Lake Superior, the Ottawa and the Potawatomi. They're all cousins. And they came here from the East Coast about a thousand years ago. And they started at Sault Ste. Marie. They all met and decided they were gonna go different directions. And the Potawatomi around the lake, this side of Lake Michigan, Ottawa on that side of Lake Michigan, and the Ojibwe all around Lake Superior and further west too. Of course, they're here in Lance and Barriga and some here where we live. So copper, of course, we all know there was copper here. Actually, this paint, this picture is like the painting in the back is almost the same one. A major amount of the world's copper came out of the copper country here from like 1880 to 1920. About half of the world's copper came from right here. This is the docks down in downtown Houghton here. And this picture, watch the, the pole here and the lift way in the back to this next picture. They say five million pounds of copper sitting there on the dock waiting to ship out. So we know quite a bit about the historic copper mining, but before that, were the ancient copper mining, which is what we're here for today. Almost all the historic mines were founded on prehistoric diggings. The first one's recognized and, and acknowledged was Samuel Knapp. He, he was an engineer for uh, the Minnesota mine and they already had the outcropping where they were mining, but he was out exploring, looking for new areas and came across this ditch in the, out in the forest that clearly was not natural. Actually, it was snow covered, but still he could see that and he followed that up to a rock face and then it dove into it. And he first he thought it was a cave. He started looking around and found in it hammer stones. So clearly it wasn't a cave, it was a mine. And grooved hammer stones, we have a number of them here. This is one, they're almost all basalt and the groove is to hasp it, to tie a handle to it. So you don't have to use the rock to break rocks, but they, they were using them to mine the copper to break the rocks to get the copper out. And of course you want to keep your fingers away from the breaking rocks. So that's what the purpose was. This is a pretty crude example of how they might've hasped it. Probably rather than that was rawhide, green hides. Once you cut them and wrap them and let them dry and they, they shrink up and then they really got a hold of it. But you got you can imagine how much battering that's gonna take by smack it against rock to break rock. So copper comes in many different ways. Some copper is still in place in the ground in fissure deposits in crack. This is on Washington Island at, and like on Isle Royal. And David pointed out to me that this is right on the shoreline. So probably in Nipissing time, it was underwater. Uh, the water was higher back then, 4,000 years ago it went down, but from six to 4,000 years ago, water levels were quite a bit higher. And so this would have been underwater, that's why it's still here. Otherwise, it, why is it still there? So fissure deposits, and in those we found the mass deposits, the big chunks that we see around town still. Those are from cracks that opened up underground and the copper got deposited, filled those holes. It also filled in conglomerate, in the holes in conglomerate. The geology here is an amazing story which I'm not gonna to try to explain right now because it put a half hour in there easy, but water got deep in the earth and got super saturated with different minerals, copper being one of them. And as it came up out of the ground and got to the surface, elements that were, the minerals that were deposited, dissolved in the water, had to precipitate out into the voids in the basalts mostly, but also in there was some conglomerate within the layers of the basalt and copper got deposited in those. And some of the mines, some of the historic mines were on conglomerate deposits, the Delaware being one of them. Amygdaloidal deposits, those are the, as the lava first came out, it was kind of gassing off. So, and then as it cools, there's holes in the lava and that copper was deposited in there. Uh, the Calumet mines were mostly amygdaloidal. And float copper, that's copper that has already been removed from the bedrock, but because the copper was deposited over a billion years ago, 
so it had over 900 million years of, of erosion, so some of the copper was already broken out of the bedrock and got pushed around by the glaciers. The glaciers would just last two million years or two and a half million years. And drift deposits, some of those float copper were found in the gravel and enough, enough copper was in the gravel that it was worthwhile to dig through there to find it. Here it is right here. This is the bridge right now and this is the ski hill and all around the base of that there was drift deposits where the historic miners saw where the Native Americans had gone through the gravel to find the, find the copper. So before it's the fissures, these are underwater, of course, in Great, Great Sand Bay, but the, the bedrock had been way above this and the bedrock got eroded away, crushed up by the billion years of erosion and removed and the glaciers might have moved the, the loose rock away from it but the copper being malleable didn't break. When the glaciers pushed across there, it pushed all the rock away because that's brittle, but the copper stayed there. And I believe most or many of the fissure mines that the historic miners found would have had copper sticking out of the ground, still embedded in the ground, but the top right there. And that, so when we talk about the copper miners, the first people up here found the float copper just on the ground when the glaciers retreated. Then they came and broke these big pieces off, and it was the latecomers that actually had to start breaking rock and following it down in the ground. Copper comes in an amazing variety of crystals and shapes, and, and this middle one, I don't know what the heck's going on there. But if you haven't been to Seaman Mineral Museum, you need to go because it's just overload. There's just row after row of different things, and it's just crazy. And of course, these fissure deposits have huge pieces in there. There's Aunt Noggin Boulder, quite a history on that. They found it was sitting in the river in Aunt Noggin, and Native Americans enjoyed it for millennia, and then we came along and said, ah, oh, I'll take that. So now it sits in the Smithsonian and the stairwell somewhere, my understanding. This is another big one they found just fairly recently. It was just about Quincy Hill, uh, 28 tons. It's in China now, I believe. money. They had money to buy it. They wanted to sell it. Well, the two guys that found it wanted to sell it. And the group who was trying to keep it here said, well, we'll take it back to Marquette and we'll raise a bunch of money there. Didn't raise enough money. And so it sold to a, somebody in Colorado, I believe, a mineral dealer. And it's in China now. I don't know if he sold it to him or renting it or what it is. But, but to, me, to me, a lot of people were upset that that left. And to me, it's another big piece of copper. It's nothing that people worked on. We have a lot of big pieces of copper. Uh, businesses, schools, they're all over. So I wasn't too upset about it, but some people were upset. So this is the Whittlesley map from 1862, and here shows the mineral range, which is where the copper was deposited in the basalts, which go under the lake from here. I'll, I'll try not to get into the geology of it. <laughs> But this shows um, the Native American deposits. What did he call them? I can't even remember. Pit mines. Pit mines. And so show back down here toward Mass, this is right here. Of course, I think it's right by the high school, the Isle Royal mine. Was it these, I don't know if it's all four. I think that's more than a mile, but they said it was more than a mile. And then up north, there was quite a few. And there's a lot more here. These are just the ones that they, that they mentioned in this map. So I've got a book here. This is one of the quotes for the Isle Royal Lode, which is at the high school. A number of Indian diggings along the outcrop across the greater section, meaning a mile. I have a number of books here you're welcome to come look at after. And this is Halsey. And he compiled all the prehistoric mentions by the historic miners. And a very good book. This is fairly new. And two more books here, One Wonderful Power by Susan Martin, kind of the authoritative book on copper, and she based hers on Griffin's book from 61, again, uh, about the copper. Hello. Glad you're here. This is a map of the Delaware and Sam Hill. Some of you older folks might remember Sam Hill, old John Wayne's, what in the Sam Hill was going on here? Sam Hill was a mining engineer and he swore so much, his name become a euphemism for swearing. That's, you gotta swear a lot to make a name for yourself that we still remember. But he 
made this map of Delaware and calls out a depression of six feet and barrels full of hammers. And then you can see the other quote. And then, so there's three veins, the Kelly vein, which is still open. And that's what we can see at the Delaware today. Well, I'll talk about that a little bit. And the Hogan vein and the Stoutenberg. Um, I think I'm pronouncing that right. And these were all fissures, cracks that the Native Americans had mined. So the historic miners came and they sunk shafts right on there thinking, well, maybe there's more copper below, but they didn't. There was not more copper to blow, so they stopped. They went several times there and then they went over to the Hogan and tried that and not working and tried the Stoltenberg and followed that till they got to the conglomerate, which was up here. This was all basalt, but this is the greenstone flow here and this is the conglomerate that's at the base of it. And in there, there was copper enough to make it economically viable. So today, the Delaware mine, this is the fissure that's available to the public, one of the few ancient mines that still exists because almost all of the prehistoric mines were scoured over by the historic miners. Historic miners were here, some of them had jobs in mines, but a lot of people came here looking to get rich. And they weren't getting rich, but they were out scouring everything. If they said, well, ancient people found some copper here, so dig it all up and find what it is. So they destroyed all the ancient diggings, or nearly all of them. This is one of the few that you can visit. The stages of production, it goes from, well, I think we've all seen raw copper. It's pretty rough coming out of the ground. This is float copper found in the lake. So you have to pound it and get the impurities out of it. The copper itself is nearly pure but it's always formed in the rock. So there's rock matrix on it. So you keep pounding it and get rid of that stuff. And then it goes through several stages. And I have pieces up here that you can look at later to get us toward the final artifact or final tool. There are artifacts now, there were tools when they were made. So they, found, they made a wide variety of different tool types, mostly utilitarian for gathering food or working wood. So a lot of spear points and knives and awls up toward the top are awls for poking holes in either birch bark or in leather to fasten them together for many different uses. Also fish hooks, but these are all spear points. These are knives in the middle and other conical spear points. I have some reproductions up here you can look at later. Uh, they had a huge variety of spear points, and this book here has a, a great compilation of all the different tool types. You're welcome to come up and look at that later. So, socketed spear points, knives, woodworking tools were a, was a big one. Most of the resources that they used were organic because that's way easier to fashion some little doodad out of wood than it would be to fashion it out of rock or copper. So most of it was organic, but of course the organics are gone after a thousand years. They just decompose, they go back to the earth. So the only thing we have to study the ancient folks here are the copper and the stone tools that they used. These are spuds and it, it depended on any one tool, depending on how you were using it. So it might be a multi use, depending on how you hasp it. If you hasp it at the end of the shaft, you chop it down for chopping ice or soil. If you put it this way on it, then you can shape the wood that way. If you put it this way, you can split the wood. This piece here is a straight back knife. It's, a, it's an amazing piece, 24 inches long, straight as an arrow. And I don't know how they could even find a piece of copper that would do that, not to mention the skill to do that. And the eyed needles, that was a huge breakthrough to sew, and then you can sew clothes that are almost waterproof. So that, that had to be a huge joy to everybody making clothes rather than poke a hole and then try to put the sinew through there. So we know a lot about what they were doing, how they were doing it, but the question is when? We don't know when the first people were looking at, the first engineers and stuff, they'd see big trees growing up out of the waste piles from the mines, and they say, well, it's at least 300 years old, might be, might be a, hundred more, maybe a thousand, but we didn't know. So our speaker, David, is um, researching that, has, and um, he's published, uh, what was it, 19 scientific four papers? From Michigan College. Four of them on here. Four. So four that are very important, and he's gonna explain all that. David also has written a book recently 
uh, Great Water. It's a, it's a novel, but it's set in prehistoric times on the Isle Royal of the ancient copper use there. Very interesting book, very, so it's a story. He, he brings in the scientific stuff in one chapter, and then he'll go back to the characters that he has brought forth and how they were living and working. So a very interesting book, and he can tell you more about that. Uh, anyways, our speaker is David Pompiani. So I'm in a cave on the beach in Hawaii, and I'm taking a moment to remind you to please subscribe to this channel to support science communication so that I can get more interviews done, get better stories out there, and we can hopefully transform how science is brought to the public. Thank you.